Welcome to our study of Song of Songs. Today we're looking at chapter 4, which I've entitled, Growing with Christ. A little review here. In chapter 1, what we're seeing in Song of Solomon is this young lady searching for God in the Old Testament. This young lady can be you. This young lady can be the church. Make it you. Searching for God, and she's looking in the Old Testament. In verse 8, she's encouraged to search the prophets. And then when she does, she finds the writings of the Messiah. So she's looking forward to the Messiah coming into the world. In chapter 2, we see Jesus in the world. Starting his three-year ministry, we see a reference to John the Baptist as the turtle dove. Then in chapter 3, the triumphal entry of Christ coming into Jerusalem. Finishing off with the crucifixion, verse 9 through verse 11. And that's where we left it off. Jesus dying upon the cross. Now in chapter 4, what we're picking up is his 40 days in the world before he ascends. And the ascension we're going to see is in verse 6 of chapter 4. And in these 40 days, Jesus was giving, these, giving the apostles and the people that he saw, 500 at one time, words of encouragement to continue to follow after him, even though he's dead. They've got to be depressed and down and out. But these are words of encouragement because there's greater things coming. And so he's, he's doing these words of encouragement not only to them but to us as well. So I entitled these six verses here as Our Efforts Recognized by Christ. That's the words of encouragement. How beautiful you are, my love. How beautiful you are. You know, I like how he says that twice. To, just to reaffirm that he, this is how he sees us. Your eyes are like doves behind your veil. Now, he told us this in chapter 1, verse 15, that your eyes are like doves. But here he's added behind your veil because in chapter 1, verse 7, she was saying to him, why should I be like one who veils herself beside the flocks of your companions? Why should I submit and follow after the Pharisees and the Sadducees? And he's saying, don't follow after the prophets. They'll point their, your way to me, the Messiah. So here he's recognizing that she recognizes him because now her veil, she's submitting to him and how beautiful you are because again, 1 Samuel 16, 7, he's looking at the heart, not the exterior. Your hair is like a flock of goats that have descended from Mount Gilead. Goats are your thoughts and intentions. We talked about that in chapter 1, verse 8. In Genesis 31, 52, we get a definition of Gilead. J Laban was chasing after Jacob because he was fleeing for his life. And Laban wanted to take his daughters and his grandsons back with him. God interfered and told Laban to be careful. And they came to terms, peace terms. And what we see is this heap, Galid, which we get for Gilead, this heap is a witness and the pillar is a witness. Laban made a pillar, Jacob made a heap. That I will not pass from this heap to you for harm, and you will not pass from this heap to, and this pillar to me for harm. So they're at peace. Their thoughts and intentions are in agreement, and we're going to part friendships here. So that's what he's recognized to her. She's got her thoughts and intentions aligned to follow after God. They've descended from Mount Gilead, and so now she's at peace with her thoughts and her intentions. Your teeth are like a flock of shorn ewes, which have come up from their washing, all of which bear twins. Good teeth come from good dental care and good food. You need to remember that. Psalm 23, verse 1 through verse 3, where are you going to get the best care? The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside quiet waters. Jesus gives us great care and he gives us good food, feeding on the word of God. And here he's recognizing she's taking care of her teeth and, and by eating good food. She's feeding on the word of God and she's listening to his leadings. So she's taking care of herself. Not one among them has lost her young. Now, if that's speaking of children, I think 1 Timothy fits well here, 4 verse 16. Pay close attention to yourself and to your teaching. Persevere in these things. 
as you do, you will ensure salvation both for yourself and those who hear you. She's feeding well on, on the Word of God, learning, and those along with her are following after her example and her teachings. She hasn't lost her young. Your lips are like a scarlet thread. Your mouth is lovely. Now, scarlet thread is found three times in the Old Testament, here in Song of Solomon, chapter 4, but you'll find it in Genesis 38, 28. That's when Tamar is having the twins of Judah, and the one twin sticks his hand out, and the midwife ties a scarlet thread around his wrist. But then he pulls his hand back in, and the other twin comes out, and that was Perez. So you need to understand that the scarlet thread is there to identify. Rahab was told to hang a scarlet thread out the window, and then when they come, everybody in the house will be saved, spared. And that identified Rahab and her family. Your speech identifies who you are. You can meet a person for the very first time, and within, I would say, 10 words, maybe less, you'll understand if they're a Christian or not just by the vocabulary that they have to share and just by the things they have to share. He's saying your speech always needs to be with grace, seasoned as it were with salt. Your lips identify. Your mouth is fitting and proper. It's because of your speech. That's how people identify who we are. Your temples, now this is really cool, are like a slice of pomegranate behind your veil. Pomegranate's that pinkish. It's like the blush. It's shame. You show shame behind your veil. Only God sees behind the veil. God understands when you feel that shame because uh, he, he's the one that sees our hearts. And this is the problem with the world today. There is no shame. The world doesn't have a problem with abortion. It doesn't have a problem with all kinds of foolishness, with drug use and alcohol use and the, the, their vulgarity in their conversation. There's no shame because people have walked away from the Word of God. But he's identifying her having that ability. You see, food well chewed, because you got good teeth, is food well digested. And when it's well digested, it nourishes your body. So the Word of God, well chewed, well digested, is well understood. That's why you can feel shame. In 2 Corinthians, I now rejoice. Not that you were made sorrowful, but that you were made sorrowful to the point of repentance. For you were made sorrowful according to the will of God. It's the word of God that makes us sorrowful. It's the will of God that gives us shame so we can change our behaviors. And he's identifying that attitude. That's a wonderful attitude to be able to feel shame. You've got to feel sorry for those that just can't feel that. Your neck is like the Tower of David. The neck is what turns the head. The neck is what gets us in focus. The neck is what gets us distracted. What is our resolve? Is it like David? In Acts 13, 22, I have found David, the son of Jesse, a man after my heart who will do all my will. That's what God wants. He's looking for people who will do the will of God. Jesse still had major, or should I say David still had major sin problems, but his heart was always serving God. When he found himself in, in sin with Bathsheba and killing of her husband, he still repented and got his sins forgiven. As long as your heart is chasing after God, you'll feel that shame. But that's what your neck needs to be, focused on God, solid, built with rows of stones on which hung thousand shields, all the round shields of the mighty men. From Ezekiel 27, 10 to 11, we see that the, um, the, the friends of the king of Tyre hung shield and helmet in you. They set forth your splendor. Inside his tower, they hung their shields to show their allegiance, their friendship too. And I believe what he's saying here is, you know, because of your attitude, because of who you are, your focus, you should have all of these friends, people around you. People are attracted to honey, or bees are attracted to honey. People are attracted to love, joy, peace, patience. Do you have friends? Or do you have hatred and envy and fear? Because people will stay away from that. But she's not like that because she's got good focus. She's chasing God and people are hanging around her because they like the example that she sets. 
That's her, her neck. In, in Mark 4.30, the kingdom of God is like a mustard seed, the smallest. Yet when it's sown, grows up and becomes larger than the garden plants and forms large branches so that the birds of the air can nest under its shade. Jesus is not saying the kingdom of God in the world. He's saying the kingdom of God in your life will become the biggest thing in your life. And when people see how spiritual you are, they will come and they will hang out with you. That's what he's trying to encourage us to be, you know, so people can feel the love coming from us because we're always consistent. That's what her neck is. Now, your two breasts, like two fawns, twins of a gazelle, which feed among the lilies. Such abused text. Fawns represent innocence, humility, not arrogance and boisterousness. When I'm studying with people, a lot of people will come in and they are so arrogant and so boisterous because they're not coming to learn the Word of God. They're coming to find a church that teaches what they believe. And they're boisterous when you teach, when you disagree with what they believe. And they usually end up walking away. When you come to feed among the lilies, you've got to have that innocence. You've got to have that humility. You can't bring baggage with you. This is the attitude you need to have. And now focus on the purpose of breasts. Breasts are to produce milk to feed the young, okay? If you're going to produce healthy milk, you have to eat healthy food, quality food. 1 Peter 2.2, 2, like newborn babes, long for the pure milk of the word. James 1.21, in humility, see, receive the word implanted. Hebrews 5.12, you've come to need milk, not solid food. You've got to get into the solid food of the Word of God, not forsaking our own assembling together, Hebrews 10.25. You've got to feed among the lilies. You're not going to grow when all you're doing is studying the Word of God by yourself. Song of Solomon, he pastures, he feeds his flock, where? Among the lilies, where two or more gather together, I'm in your presence. God's the teacher, we're the students. And we need to remember that when we understand each other as the student, when we collectively go together to God, we teach one another. No one is superior to the other. And the more we collectively come together, the stronger we're going to be. We're going to have the milk that the, word, the world needs. The second part, you need to feed the young. In chapter 7-7, seven, seven, he describes her breasts like clusters of dates or clusters of the vine. And that's important. And he's, you know... If you look at it from a physical visual, it makes absolutely no sense. But when you understand that we're here to feed people, then if it's clusters of dates, then there's lots and lots of food. And that's how the church needs to be. That's how you need to be. What do you have to offer people when they come to you, when you have an opportunity to teach? New Jerusalem in Isaiah 66 is talking about the church. And he says for the people that are coming to the church, that you may nurse and be satisfied with her comforting breast, that you may suck and be delighted with her bountiful bosom. He's saying the church has the wisdom and the understanding and you need to come and to feed. And that's what we're all about. That's what he's trying to get us to focus in on when he's talking about the breast. Verse six, until the cool of the day, when the shadows flee away, I will go to the mountain of myrrh and the hill of frankincense. Now. He's, he's encouraged her these 40 days, and now he's ready for the ascension, okay? And the, myrrh of, uh, the myrrh, uh, mountain of myrrh, that's the teachings, and the hill of frankincense, there's the miracles. And Jesus says, I tell you the truth, it is to your advantage that I go away. If I do not go away, the helper will not come to you, but if I go away, I will send him to you. And then what does he do? Words of encouragement. In Luke 12, 20, uh, Luke 12, 45 and 49, he opened their minds to understand the scriptures so that they would be, stay solid and encouraged until he returns on the day of Pentecost. And behold, I'm sending forth the promise of my Father upon you, but you are to stay in the city until you are clothed with power from on high. And that finishes the first part of chapter 4. Thank you.